Thank you. It's, it's a great privilege for me, it's an honor for me to be here uh, to share with you the experiences that we have gone through. Uh, I'm not uh, here to give you any academic lecture or anything. It's simply telling what I do, why I do the things the way, the way I do. Some people uh, like what I do, some people don't like what I do. And while doing things, I raise a lot of questions to myself and to the world. And I try to uh, give my own answer to those questions. And again, there are debates about those answers are uh, appropriate for the persons who are, lis who are listening. So this will be kind of a chat. We'll have an occasion to um, raise give comments and questions so that we can continue this discussion. But as I said, I'm very privileged that I could get a chance to uh, talk to you who are in the helm of things to be done uh, in the country, in the society, in the state itself. Uh, I'm given a cue where to start because uh, of the beggar program. <laughs> you mentioned that, but that's not what I was thinking of mentioning. But since you opened it up, and just to clarify, uh, I was always insisting all human beings are kinds of illness. No exception to that. An economic system or economic theory has pushed us into the wrong direction. The economic theory, the capitalist theory, tells us that every young people growing up has to be prepared to get a job. And I was always saying, the job is not the destiny of a human being. The destiny of a human being is to be a creator, to be an entrepreneur, to be a problem solver. So that's the direction we should go. And people raise questions. Not everybody is a, an entrepreneur. Uh, so you have to make sure that those very small section of the people who are entrepreneur so you have to be prepared to provide jobs for those people. I didn't accept the word that not everybody is an entrepreneur. So once I got into this debate, one idea came to me, why don't I start a project within Grameen Bank, which will be exclusively devoted to beggars. If the beggars can prove that they can become entrepreneurs, this will give me a big boost in my argument. Look, even a beggar can become an entrepreneur. So that was the purpose immediately. We used to let, give money, give loans to government bank branches to beggars, but this is out of money, this is some will get. But this was a project. We focused on the as you mentioned. I made it simple. I said, if you are interested, a staff can give one. Choose one beggar to lend money. Uh, so the restriction is, you have, this is your decision, it's not my decision. If you want, you can do it because we are trying at it. We made it very simple. Uh, we go and talk to the beggars, understand their life, how he or she became a beggar. Because not only I wanted to address the beggars, I wanted to focus on generational beggars. Meaning that not in his or her lifetime, he or she became a beggar. Her parents were beggars too. Maybe the, her grandparents were beggars too. So we're trying to look at the traditionally entrenched beggars for generations. So we have to go and find those people, not the one just became beggar three, three years back. We wanted to see because he's a deep-rooted beggar. So there's, he had no experience of other life because his grandparents are beggar, his uh, parents are beggars, now he or she is beggar. So this is deep-rooted inside. If he and she can become an entrepreneur, this would be a demonstration. Look, it is in, embedded in human being. So that was the beginning. We made it very simple. The message we gave to the beggars, the one that we wanted to talk to, finally selected the person. Look, as you go from house to house begging, in Bangladesh, in the rural areas, usually a beggar goes around the village, house to house, and say, oh, I didn't eat for several days, please give me something, my children are hungry, this kind of stuff. So we said, 
as you go from house to house, would you like to carry some merchandise with you? Like bananas, some fruits, some uh, toffee, some uh, cookies, so that children would love or par their parents would like to buy something from you for their kids. Or some toiletries, soaps and something. Something simple that you can carry. And if you are interested, we'll provide you the money to buy the stuff so that you can sell. And they loved that idea, that yes. And we made it sound very simple by saying, as you, you go there anyway, all these homes. So this is not extra job for you to go to those houses. You go there out of your own necessity. All you have to do, carry something with you. This is the additional part we're reading. And we'll provide the money for that. They liked it. So they joined, one after another. And the usual loan they would be asking for ranged from $12 to $15. That's about the size of the money they wanted. We said, okay, we'll give you the money. And as you mentioned, there is no time limit to pay back. So you can either spend your lifetime not pay back, still you'll not be a defaulter because there's no time limit. So you feel relaxed and no interest. So that interest will not accumulate on your money. So the money will remain as it is. That's fine with them. And they started, and they loved it. Many beggars joined that program. And I wanted to know after a few, after a year or so, what happened, how many, what they're doing. I started talking to them. I go to the villages, talking to them. Do they enjoy it or they don't like it? They loved it. Their explanation, most of the explanation was, as we go to the homes now, the begging, they open the door for us, let us in. Previously, when we didn't have this, they will say, well, come back tomorrow or come back on Friday uh, through the window. They will not open the door. Now they open the door and let me sit on a stool, which they never did before. So the respect they get because they brought, she brought some merchandise, open it up, kids come around. They want to buy this, want to buy that. Mother is struggling with the children. No, not this, not that. So it became a family thing. And some said, now they know which house is good for begging and which house is good for selling. I tell my colleagues, I said, look, they didn't go to the Harvard Business School, but they know the market segmentation, which way to go, how to do, the, do that. So this. People may be beggar, may be illiterate, but they're smart, just like any other person. So she enjoys it. Now they get a new job for themselves. Many housewives give them a list to bring for them. So they became personal shoppers because the women cannot go to the marketplace to buy things and husbands always forget to buy things for them. So they, they found this is a convenient way, give her this kind of a uh, list and she brings it, I pay, pay her, and that's it. So it became very popular. Within two years, of more than 200,000 beggars we had. And out of them, at that time, more than 25% stopped begging completely because they became door-to-door -door salesperson because they communicate between the market and so on. So this is the kind of thing, people, we never gave them an opportunity to do things. And I keep raising this question, why poverty? After seeing this again and again for many, many years, I came to my explanation, my conclusion. I keep saying poverty is not created by the poor people. It's not their fault. It's not because something is lacking in them. They're as smart as anybody else. Simply, society never gave them the space so that they can grow as tall as everybody else. So poverty is not created by the poor people. Poverty is created by the system that we follow. So the root cause of poverty is in the system, not in the people. That makes all the difference. The moment we say it's not their fault, it's the fault of the system, in order to change the condition of the people from poverty to non-poverty, you have to concentrate on the system itself. And I give the example of how the system has been wrong for them. I give the example of financial system. I said, look at all the banks. 
the moment you say bank, immediately you think of something which works for the rich. This is not for the poor people. Globally, more than half the population in the world has no connection with the financial institution. Financial institution remains something for the people above that level. So the principle of banking behind everything they do is so almost unwritten principle is the more rich you are, the more we're willing to serve you. Richer you are, more attractive you are. So we had to undo that system so that it comes to the people. So what you hear about Gamin Bank, the bank that we created in Bangladesh and the word microfinance became popular and so on. The basic principle of Gamin Bank is poorer you are, more attractive you are. If you are the poorest, you are the most attractive person for us. So we are always in search of the poorest person. When go to a village, you start a Grameen bank, we are always looking for the person who is the poorest person in the village. Because our idea is, unless you start with the poorest, you will never get to her. If you go start at the middle, then you start moving up from the middle, the bottom again left out, even among the poor. So we are always looking for the poorest person. So we had to define within Grameen Bank, how do we identify the poorest person? And we have very elaborate instructions and elaborate training to identify the poorest person. And one of the basic features of the poorest person, she lives in a broken down house, quote unquote house, it doesn't look like a house, it's a shed, with enormously leaking roof. Bangladesh is a monsoon country, lots of rain. So you imagine if you have a leaky roof, open roof, it's all inside. And this one room. She has whatever position she has, it is within that room. That's all she has. So you have to find that person first in the village. Who is that person? So our staff is to go around identifying that, talking to the villagers, do you have someone like this? And say, maybe you go to that corner, maybe she is the one you are looking for. So finally you find her. And we say, even if she lives in a house like that, no leaking roof, one room and so on, if she has any uh, furniture inside the house, you have not reached the poorest yet. So she should be living or her family should be living in a plain floor, mostly muddy and clumsy and so on. And if she has any other position, maybe you are not in the right house, you have to find another person. So that's how we begin. And when we finally reach that person, we explain what Grameen Bank does. And finally, after listening everything, she said, not me, I don't want to borrow money. I don't want to get into trouble. You find somebody else. She refuses to take the money. And we train our staff repeatedly. If you found that person, if this is, your reaction, this is her reaction, then you got it. She's the person we are looking for. And your job is to go back again and again, build confidence in her. So that someday she will say, maybe I should try in a small way. And that will be your success, the beginning of it. And then step by step, by step she will move on to, on to that. So this is how the Grameen Bank was created, which is kind of antithesis of the entire banking system that we have. People ask me, how did you design Grameen Bank? Because after all, it's a bank. You have to design things, procedures, rules, and so on, because it's a very elaborate structure. So I started saying maybe we did something like this. When we needed a procedure, we just look at the conventional banks, how they do it, because I don't know anything about banking. And that was my best advantage, because not knowing banking allowed me to do things bankers will never do. If I knew banking, then I have to do the same old rules and it will not work. So I look at the banks, what they do. Once we learn how they do it, I just go and do the opposite. And it works. And it became the Grameen Bank. So Grameen Bank is actually is the mirror image of a conventional bank. They go to the rich, we go to the poor. They go to the city center, we go to the remote villages. Because not only we work in the village, we work in the remote village. That's how our 
because we have to always go to the most difficult village first. Then you come to the less difficult one and so on, continue. And they go to men, we go to women. So this is another strange thing because 97% of the borrowers of Grameen Bank are women. We started out to make it 50-50. Right at the beginning we said 50% of our borrowers must be women. Why? Because I was criticizing the banking system. I said banking system is wrong because it lends money only to men. Bankers were very mad at me. They said, this is not true, you are unnecessarily accusing us. I said, no, look at your information. Not even 1% of the borrowers of all the bank happen to be women. Even if you don't lend the money to a rich woman, because she is a woman. So I wanted to undo that. When I began, I wanted to make sure half the borrowers are women. So I did that. It took us six years. It's not easy. It's very difficult. The women say, no, don't give the money to me, give it to my husband. We said, no, we are not talking about husband, we are talking about you. It took a lot of time because she is very nervous. She doesn't have any idea of how to handle money. So it took a lot of time to build confidence in her. I said, it's a very simple thing. When she says, I cannot handle money, I don't know how to handle money, and I'm afraid of it, I tell my students who are working with me, that when she says that, always remember this is not her voice. This is the voice of the history which created her. Because ever since she was born, she was told she is nobody. She was told she made a mistake by being a girl. She should have been a boy. She created misery for the family because she is a girl. So I said she has been accused again and again for being a girl. And everything she does, somebody says the wrong thing she is doing. So she wants to live a life where she wants to make sure she, nobody feels her existence. So that she, she is a non-existence person. Now you want to give her money, she gets very afraid, because now I'll be visible. She doesn't want to be visible. So I have to go back and peel off all the fears that history has pushed around her, layer by layer. Hopefully someday the real person will emerge from it and say, maybe I, I should try. That it took six years for us to make that happen that yes, I tried, and tried it, and then other women got very interested how you did it, and it spread. After six years, finally we have 50-50 women. Then we saw money going to the family through women, brought so much more benefit to the family, than the same amount of money going to the family through men. So we changed the whole thing. We said, let's focus on women. So ever since we are focusing on women, over the years, we became 97% women. Then we made a decision, stop here, otherwise it will be 100% women. Then they say, maybe men cannot do this. I said, men can do this, but impact in the family is much better if you enter the family through women. That's why we follow that tool. So that's the grameen, and we don't have collateral. We lend out billions of dollars worth of money, no papers, no legal documents. And bankers get very shaken, but oh, how do you do that? Billions of dollars, no document. I said, because people pay back. We had no problem. They said maybe Bangladesh is one thing can happen, but it will not happen any other. Now, but idea of microfinance is spread all over the world. It works everywhere. We were challenged to do it in the United States, so we created a company called Grameen America. Two, ten years back, started in New York City, in Jackson Heights. First branch was in Jackson Heights. It worked beautifully, lending money to the extremely poor in New York City. Then everybody wanted another Grameen Bank branch in their neighborhood, another neighborhood. Now we have seven branches in New York City. And the other cities keep coming, that we need it. Our poor is more, worse than the poor in New York City. Please help us. So we have 20 branches now all over the United States. In Omaha, Nebraska, Charlotte, North Carolina, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Indianapolis and so on. In 12 cities, 20 branches. Totaling, reaching out about 100,000 borrowers now in 10 years. We have given out over a billion dollar loan to all these women. Startup loan is about $1,500. $1,500 a lot of money in, even in America. They have given their life to get to that $1,500 to borrow them. Repayment rate over the 10 years, over all the branches, near 100%, always above 
never fail. No documents, nothing. Most of our borrowers are undocumented women. They don't even have a credibility, credential for their own. Still we lend money. We have no problem in doing that. So that's the idea of microcredit and so on. To undo the system that we have created. I said we have to create the, another class of bank, banks. Bank for the poor. Today all the banks we have are literally bank for the rich. We don't say it, but that's what they are. I said if that is so, then why don't we deliberately create bank for the poor? And then serve these people. And I remind people again and again, particularly the policymakers, by saying that, look, credit is like an economic oxygen. If we don't have oxygen in this room, we cannot breathe. We will collapse. We become dysfunctional. I said, that's what happens when you don't have economic oxygen for people. Then they cannot function. They cannot activate themselves. And we call them poor people and blame them. It's not their fault. Simply, they are missing the economic oxygen. The moment you connect them with economic oxygen, they become active, they become productive, they become intelligent, using their capability and so on. And that makes all the difference in their life. But the society never created that. I kind of gave example of a bonsai tree, saying that you take the seed of the tallest tree and put it in a flower pot, it grows only this big. As a poor people, are like bonsai people. There is nothing wrong with their seed. Simply society never gave them the space on which to grow as tall as everybody else. So it's not the fault of the person. It's the fault of the things that we run, we create, we uh, make policies and so on. That's what the fault lies. We have to look at ourselves rather than look at them. So we create institutions like I mean, bank, microcredit and so on. Another thing happened and I'd like to share with you. All our borrowers, 90, all the men and women, now we have 9 million borrowers in Grameen Bank, are illiterate, cannot read, cannot write. So we made a rule in right from the beginning of Bank, Grameen Bank. We must make sure the second generation in these families will not repeat the history of their parents as far as literacy is concerned. All of them must be literate. It's our responsibility to make sure they become literate. So we mobilized ourselves to make sure that they are literate. We succeeded, made the second generation of children, make, making them literate and educated, gave them education loans so that they can go as far as they want to go and have education. They can become graduates, they can become master's degree holders, they become doctors, they can be engineers, because money is not a problem. Because Grameen Bank lends the money as a student loan, so you go as far as you want. So we have many, many hundreds of thousands of these young people with very good degrees and so on, but no jobs. So keep complaining. Because Bangladesh doesn't have many jobs. They said, then why did you send us to the college and the universities to all this thing if they have no jobs? And I thought for a while, what is the answer? I came with my answer. I said, why are you looking for jobs? Of course, they cannot answer this question because you are supposed to have a job. I said, did your teacher tell you to have a job? Or your book kind of encouraged you to have a job? I said, no matter who said the so, remember, job is the wrong idea. It's an obsolete idea. It used to be there in the past, but it's now gone, finished. You remove it from your mind about the job orientation. You tell yourself every morning you wake up in, in your bed, tell yourself that I'm not a job seeker, I'm a job creator. And think like a job creator. Behave like a job creator. Feel tall, not small, like a job seeker. Job seeker is a small guy. Job creator is a big guy. Feel like a job creator. Then they say, well, that's, you can say that, but nobody taught us how to start a business. We don't know how to start a business. We are told all kinds of things in our classes, in physics, chemistry, biology, history. We learned everything, but they never taught us how to start a business. I said, you are a son or you are a daughter of Grameen Bank mother. Your mother joined Grameen Bank 30 years back or 40, 20 years back. She's an illiterate woman. She took 2,000 taka or 5,000 taka and started a business. 
And ever since, for the last 20 years, she's paying this back and taking a larger loan and a larger loan, and that's where you're born. And then she sent you to school. We financed you. Now you're telling me what your illiterate mother could do, you cannot do it yourself. Who taught your illiterate mother? Did she go to school to learn how to start a business? I said, you know, what is the difference between your illiterate mother and yourself? The difference is your mother is a natural human being. You are an artificial human being. Your school has made you an artificial human being. As a natural human being, she knew what to do. She didn't hesitate for a second. She took the money and started it. She didn't worry about it because her friends are doing it. I can do it too. I can raise chicken. I can raise vegetables. I can sew clothes. I eat and I can sell. I can pay the money back. What is the problem? But your education has completely wiped out all your natural things that you had. I said, what, why didn't you do something? Why didn't you go back to your mother? Remove all the things you learned from schools and be a natural human being and come back with a business idea, with a business proposal and give it to us. We created a social business venture capital fund. We take your proposal. Once we fulfill all our requirements, we finance you. We become your partner. It's not a loan. Your mother was a loanee. She borrowed. She took a loan. For you, we give you investment. We become a partner. So you are in partnership with us. And let's do it together and make it successful. Once it's successful, you return the money that we gave you. Because we are social business, we are not interested in your profit. Profit stays with you, you just move on. And if, when you return the money that I gave you, we'll put it investment to somebody else. So that this same money will go continue to others. In the beginning, young people were hesitant. They don't know what we are talking about. Now, once it started, few people came and we financed it. Now, every month, on an average, we get more than 2,000 investments made. And in total, we have now 31,000 young people who are invested with this money to start business. And each month, it becomes a larger and larger number because it's becoming more and more popular. Now, everybody says, the one who said, maybe I'm, I'm not good for uh, business, when he sees his friend is starting a business, he said, okay, he can do it, I can do it too. So he comes with a proposition, business proposal. Then we check it and finance it. In our system, nobody is rejected. We simply say you have to improve your business plan, come back again, and these are the flaws in your investor, but you'll be back again. We will be, we'll, we'll be waiting for you so that we can finance you. And nobody is abundant. Even if your business fails, you cannot pay the money back because the money that you invested, we invested, you cannot put the money back. We will not be screaming at you because we tell the people that failing in business is a normal thing. It's nothing abnormal. So we work together again. Come up with the flaws, come up with a better idea and give you another investment so that you can continue. And we'll be with you until you become a successful person. So what's wrong with that? So they feel very relaxed, very enthusiastic. Now they come up with beautiful business ideas and so on. And now my faith in entrepreneurship becomes stronger. I said all these illiterate women with a small loan can become entrepreneur. The women who's illiterate, Women who never crossed the boundary of their villages. They don't know anything about the world. If she can become a successful entrepreneur, anybody in the world can become a successful entrepreneur. Simply our system is not geared that way. Our system mm -hmm. is to push mm -hmm. more money to the guy who has more money already. And that's way we are pursuing them, for forgetting the people who are the behind. So as a result, we created a world which all the wealth is concentrated at few hands. And I mentioned in my book that eight people in the world own more wealth than the bottom 50% of the entire world population, which is nearly about 4 billion people. The wealth of the 4 billion people equals to the wealth of the top eight persons. And we know those eight persons, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Mark Zuckerman, these are our friends. These are not kind of bloodthirsty 
capitalist with a kind of funny face. This is a very normal human being. What is wrong? Why all the money go to them, not to the people at the bottom? Because the system is designed that way. That's what we call capitalist system. It's designed in a way to suck up all the wealth and push it in the top. And the reason they made a basic, you can change that system by changing the basic fundamental interpretation of human being in the system. Because the whole system is based on the assumption that human beings are driven by self-interest. So assumed all human beings are selfish. I said that is a totally wrong interpretation of human being. So we are carrying on an economic system which is based on a wrong interpretation of human being, being a selfish, a greedy human being. And now system created us as a greedy person because that's what they t tell us in our classroom, that they, you have to be selfless. Uh, you have to be driven by selfless, selfishness to, make, to become successful. The more money you make, more successful you are because you are accumulating wealth for yourself. I said the real human beings are both selfish and selfless. The selfless part is completely eliminated from the discussion of economic theory. It's not accommodated there. So what we have done in Bangladesh now, it is spreading around the world, created a different kind of business. Business to solve problems which is based on selflessness. We are not interested in making money out of this business. We are creating this to solve problems. And we call it social business. Non-dividend company to solve human problems. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. many, many of those companies are coming up. We have many companies in Bangladesh. Now they're Indians, they are coming up. There are a lot of big companies who want to start social businesses and so on to solve the problem of water, problem of unemployment, problem of healthcare, all the things you do every day because this is our job as a government to do things. And this is what we are trying to do with the social business and so on. And uh, it become popular in other countries. France has become very interested. They want to adopt it for the whole city of Paris, how to solve the problem of Paris to social business. Germany became very interested. So we have now many, many people rediscovering themselves that we can do many different things that we do. So the <clears throat> two things, and I'll conclude here. We have to address, this is what we are trying to address. Reinterpret human beings. Number one, human beings are not 100% selfish. Human beings are a mixture of selfishness and selflessness. So on the selfishness, we have the business that we run today. Everything is about making money for yourself, for the shareholders. So that's a selfish business. We create another kind of business on the basis of selflessness business to solve people's problem in a sustainable way. Suddenly, you see all the problems around you can be solved in a business way. Governments and our foundations and charity organizations, they're good at giving charity for solving this problem. If you want to solve the problem of water, government says, I'll give you free water. If you want to solve the problem of healthcare, government says, I give you free healthcare. If you want to give education, I said, government says, I'll give you free education. Fine, if you can give it. But in the name of giving free education, giving free health care, giving free water, most people don't get it. Because the government can afford it. It has to be a bureaucracy. It has to be done some, by contractors or something. And it doesn't do the work that you want to do. There's a lot of corruption, a lot of misuse of the money and so on. So you continue. I'm not stopping the government to do that. In the meantime, citizens can do it. Help fill the gap. Create healthcare social businesses, like we have created eye care hospitals in Bangladesh as a social business. So you, you can do the cataract operation for a small amount of money. And the hospital runs by its own income, so you don't have to look for any charity or anything. Yeah. I always yeah. point out charity is a good idea, but one basic problem of charity is Charity money goes out, does a wonderful work, but money doesn't come back. It has only one time use. If I can design the whole thing as a business, as a social business, then in social business, money goes out, does the same job, but the money comes back. Then you can use the money again and again. Every year you put new money, this money becomes bigger and bigger money. You go out and do, do more and more of it. Mm. So that's where the social business things come. That's where the creativity of citizens come. That was the activism, the citizenship comes. So the government is important, 
but the government has to excite the citizens also so that they can also take actions to solve the problem. It's not the, the, if you take the job 100% to be done by the government, it will be extremely difficult to solve this problem. And finally, what government does, okay, if you are poor, we'll put you on welfare. Uh, government will give you money every month. I said, that's not a solution. Welfare is not a solution of poverty. <clears throat> welfare only hides poverty. It doesn't solve poverty. In order to solve poverty, you have to activate the person, not the, make the person numb. That you stay home, I give you the money. That is taking away the entire creative capacity that human being has. That's not the solution. So this is the kind of thing, one part, the reinterpretation of human being. Another part of the interpretation of human being, capitalist system has told that everybody has to have a job. So our education system built on the principle that we have to get these young people job ready. I said, that's a shame. Because education should, system should not be preparing young people to become job ready. They should be preparing young people life ready, ready for the life. And that is what the entrepreneurship comes in, that I do the things on my own. Because human essence of human being is the creativity of the human being. If you push the person to a job, Job is the end of creativity. The moment you cut into a slot of a job, your creativity is gone. Because you are a much bigger person. But you have pushed yourself into a little slot, whatever big slot that may be, but it curtails your positions. You have to obey the certain principles and policies guided by somebody else. You have to follow that. You are not yourself anymore. I said, why don't you be yourself and do the things that have been done before? That's what your, uh, your job was. That's what the uh, your uh, uh, expectations was and so on. So if we can reinterpret that, all human beings are born as entrepreneurs. If they want to choose jobs, that's fine. But they are born as entrepreneurs and we provide all the facilities so that they become real entrepreneurs by creating institutional facilities to do so. So that's where our work is going on. I was saying that we, there's no reason why anybody shall, should be unemployed. I said the whole problem of unemployment is created by the concept of employment. Imagine if the concept of employment didn't exist, will there be unemployment? Because I'm not looking for a job, how can I be unemployment? So if I'm not looking for a job, there's no question of unemployment. So there's no reason why I should be looking for a job, because I'm creating things for myself, and I want to expand myself and so on and so forth. So this is the direction that we should do. Then in, in that world, there's no unemployment at all, because uh, Unemployment doesn't make sense anyway. Why should energetic, creative young person do nothing, sit there and call themselves unemployed? How can, how can somebody sit there unless economic system has put a spell on that person that you, you can't move anymore and you call yourself unemployed? Otherwise, you, you are a go-getter. Go ahead, do things. There's thousand and one things to do around you. Do things because now you say, oh, you don't get a job, so you're unemployed. You sit there. And then you demonstrate on the street, you have to give an unemployment benefit for us because we are unemployed. That's the wrong person to it. So these are the kind of overall things that we are engaged in. I'll stop here and let you uh, raise questions, uh, any directions you want, and uh, I'll be very happy to respond in my own way. Thank you. Thank you.